Hi there, ladies and gentlemen. This is Mr. Workman with your screencast session two for the molecular uh, central dogma uh, of molecular biology unit, DNA and protein synthesis. Let's get started right away. For this screencast, which is session two of this unit, your targets are displayed here. You need to be able to identify essentially what the structure of DNA is. You should, you should be able to identify the four different nucleotides of DNA. You should be able to uh, identify what the three components of each type of nucleotide is. You should know what a polynucleotide is and you should know how each nucleotide is bonded to the next one in the polyti polynucleotide structure of DNA. You also need to know about uh, Rosalind Franklin, Erwin um, Shargoff, James Watson, and Francis Crick and their roles in identifying the structure of DNA. You need to be able to define complementary base pairing, identify the base pairs, uh, the bases that pair together. You should be able to describe what we call the anti-parallel nature of the double helix and to really be able to assess this we're going to want you to demonstrate that you understand the molecule well enough so that you can draw a pair of complementary nucleotides. In your packet you have some resources there's a concept map on page 37 that you should try to complete. Uh, there is an activity that we will do in class on pages 39 through 41. Uh, the double helix diagram on page 43 is a good one to look at the general structure of, to get to know the general structure of DNA. And the diagrams on pages 44 through 47 in your packet are very good to use and study. And then we have a practice quiz on page 49. So let's get right to it here. Okay, so DNA structure. Here's a, a main topic heading for you here, DNA. Uh, you should know that DNA is qualified, or cl excuse me, classified as a nucleic acid. That's what the N and the A stand for. They stand for nucleic acid. It's a big molecule. It's a long, what we call double-stranded molecule made up of monomers known as nucleotides. The DNA molecule is what we call a polynucleotide. We'll get more into that later. You should know that this structure, this molecule, it, what it does is it stores and it transmits what we call heredity information by coding for the production of proteins. Uh, heredity information, it, if you think about the word inherit, like for example, I inherited a clock from my grandmother. Well, what I also inherited from my grandmother and my father and, and mother are the genetic information. Uh, and the way that I inherited that was uh, through this DNA molecule. And it's my DNA that codes for the production of proteins. We have a little video here as an introduction to watch. Sorry, let's try that again. DNA is a long chain of nucleotides. Each nucleotide consists of a five carbon sugar bonded to a nitrogen base and a phosphate group. The five carbon sugar or pentose in DNA is deoxyribose. Deoxy because it lacks an oxygen atom that is normally found in the ribose sugar molecule. The nitrogen bases are either a purine, a double ring structure, in the case of adenine and guanine, or a pyrimidine, a single ring structure, as in cytosine and thymine. The phosphate is attached to the fifth carbon atom of the sugar and links each nucleotide to form a polymer or polynucleotide, the whole DNA molecule. This results in a backbone with a repeating pattern of sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate. The sequence of nitrogen bases on this backbone is specific and unique for every gene on a chromosome. But the story also has a twist. The double helix or spiral structure that Watson and Crick unravel. You see, DNA consists of two polynucleotide chains. Sure phosphate molecules form the backbones on the outside of the helix. Nitrogen bases are paired in the interior of the helix. Adenine pairs with thymine, A with T, and cytosine pairs with guanine, C with G. The pairs are held together by hydrogen bonds, and it is these hydrogen bonds that cause the strands to coil, forming the helical structure. If all the DNA in your body were uncoiled, stretched out, and connected. 
Okay, that's it for the video. <clears throat> so continuing on with our DNA structure and apps, as you recall what you just saw in that video, please understand that this thing called a nucleotide is the monomer of DNA, or we could call it the building block of DNA. <clears throat> Each nucleotide consists of three parts. It's going to have a phosphate, and you should know what a phosphate group is. That's one of our functional groups that we learned about, a deoxyribose, as it is called, a pentose sugar, and one of four types of nitrogen-containing bases. So there it is in words, deoxyribose sugar, the phosphate group, and the nitrogen base. You should probably draw a schematic uh, similar to this diagram right here. So this, what this is is one particular nucleotide. You should know that our nitrogenous bases, <clears throat> there are four types, and there are two classes of bases. And Mr. Gales might tell you that CGAT stands for Chris Gales Awesome Teacher, but in fact the C, G, and A, T stand for cytosine, guanine, adenine, and thymine. I'm not suggesting that Mr. Gales is not an awesome teacher. In fact, he is, but C, G, A, and T do stand for the names of the nitrogenous bases. There are two classes of these bases. So adenine and guanine are called purines, and cytosine and thymine are called pyrimidines. There's an easy way to remember this. If you remember uh, <coughs> that A and G, uh, that's the symbol for silver, pure silver on the periodic table. Or if you remember cut the pi, CT, cut uh, the pi for pyrimidines. Um, and you can also think of a pi as a single ring structure. And cytosine and thymine are single rings of carbon and nitrogen. <clears throat> DNA is what we call a polynucleotide. So what that means is that many of those nucleotides are synthesized together or uh, linked together via phosphodiester bond. And what it is, and if you really look at this diagram down here, and you can blow this up on your screen, it would be good. A phosphate is linked to the fifth carbon in the ribose sugar. And then that third carbon in the ribose sugar is linked to the next phosphate. And that phosphate is linked to the next sugar, the fifth carbon in the next sugar. And then in that sugar, the third carbon is linked to a phosphate. And then that phosphate is linked to the next sugar, particularly bonded to the fifth carbon in that sugar. And so what we see is that the linkages between nucleotides occur between phosphate groups and the sugar molecules, the deoxyribose, uh, deoxyribose molecules. So you need to understand that DNA is a polynucleotide, but what you're seeing here in this diagram is only one half of the DNA molecule. There would be another side of the molecule over here. So continuing on this, again, this diagram <clears throat> is showing you only half of the DNA molecule, and this is more of a cartoonish representation schematic of the diagram of the molecule. And notice up here this 5 prime end, and down here this 3 prime end. And what that 5 and what that 3 refer to are the carbons that are numbered on the sugars. So the, the first carbon in this chain here is a carbon that's numbered 5. And the last carbon in this chain in this diagram, which would be right here, is the third carbon of the 5 carbon deoxyribose. And so when we name an end of these polynucleotide chains, we have a 5 prime end and a 3 prime end. Now understanding what the 5 end is and what the 3 end is is going to be critical for your understanding of what we go through next, which is the process of replication and transcription and translation. So here are some words that define what a polynucleotide is. It's many nucleotides joined together between the phosphate and the sugars. And just so you understand, <clears throat> those sugar and phosphate molecules of the nucleotides make up what we call the sides of the ladder of the molecule. If you can think of DNA as a ladder, the sides of the molecule uh, or the sides of the ladder are the sugar and the phosphate, whereas the rungs in our ladder model of the DNA molecule, the rungs would be the paired bases. Now this is a picture of Morris Wilkins who worked with uh, a lady named Rosalind Franklin. And this is a picture of Rosalind Franklin. And um, what's interesting about our ladder here is that it, it twists into a spiral, otherwise known as a double helix. And so really what it is is two polynucleotide chains that are wound around one another. And this structure was originally pictured um, by 
Rosalind Franklin where she used a technique called x-ray crystallography and this gentleman Morris Wilkins who worked with Rosalind sort of let the cat out of the bag uh, to speak so to speak to uh, Watson and Crick they got a hold of Rosalind's x-ray crystallograph and from that they inferred the structure of this molecule to this day, Watson and Crick get a lot of credit for discovering the DNA molecule, and Rosalind doesn't get as much credit, but they owe a lot of what they discovered to interpretation of her crystallograph of the structure. <clears throat> now, another thing that we uh, know Watson and Crick used was this idea of they figured out what we call complementary base pairing. Now, complementary base pairing, what that really means is that um, A complements T, or adenine, complements thymine and guanine complements cytosine and that has to do with their particular structure um, and this first came about from uh, research done by Erwin Shargoff and Watson and Crick pulled that information out of Erwin Shargoff and Shargoff's rules simply state that in any organism and Shargoff did this he um, studied a whole bunch of DNA in a bunch of different organisms and what he kept finding was that the mass of adenine in their DNA would equal the mass of the thymine in their DNA. The mass of cytine, cytosine in their DNA would also equal the mass of guanine and so these are what we call Shargoff's rules. Uh, adenine mass is always equal to thymine mass and cytosine mass is always equal to guanine mass. Now this doesn't mean that adenine and thymine are 50 percent of the molecule and cytosine and guanine are 50 percent of the molecule. That's not necessarily the case. Adenine and thymine could represent 60% of the DNA mass, and cytosine and guanine could represent 40% of the DNA mass. <clears throat> it's just that cytosine and guanine are always occurring in equal masses to one another, and adenine and thymine are always occurring in equal masses to one another. So those are Shargoff's rules. And it's important for you to know that Watson and Crick, taking information from Rosalind Franklin, well, Morris Wilkins, really, uh, who took it from Rosalind Franklin, and taking information from Erwin Shargoff, they inferred the structure of the molecule. And so what we get in a complete picture is this double polynucleotide. So here's a polynucleotide chain, and here's another polynucleotide chain. And when you really look at this diagram, uh, what we need to understand is that one polynucleotide uh, is oriented up, and the other one's oriented down, so to speak. If you look at the purple arrows, the one on the left is pointing down, and the one on the right is pointing up. But these two different polynucleotide chains are held together by hydrogen bonding. And it's due to this chemical structure of adenine base and thymine base. They both have two sites where hydrogen bonding can occur. And guanine and cytosine, they have three sites where hydrogen bonding can occur. And so generally, they fit together. Now, they're not actually shaped like this arrow shape or this curved shape. That's, that's a cartoon trying to give you guys an idea of why they're shaped the way they're shaped. But really what it is is the hydrogen bonding between the base, bases. And what I was referring to here with this arrow pointing down and this arrow on the right pointing up, that's what we call anti-parallel. So I'm going to orient my hands in an anti-parallel way. Here's a pinky and here's a thumb, and here's my pinky and here I, here's my thumb, but what I'm going to do is orient them this way, okay, so that my pinky and my thumbs are together, all right? So what I've done is I've oriented my hands in an anti-parallel fashion. This is how the molecule is built. It's anti-parallel. One side of the molecule is what we call anti-parallel to the other. And the result is, is that the five end on this left side is on the top of this diagram. The three end on the left side is on the bottom. But the reverse is true on the right side. So we've got the three end on the top of the right side of this diagram and the five end on the bottom of the right side of this diagram. And that orientation has to do with the carbons that are first and last or last and first as the case may be on different sides of the molecule and that orientation is what we call anti-parallel it's that the fact that the two polynucleotide strands run or are oriented in opposite directions <clears throat> this is a schematic diagram of cytosine and guanine and what I want you to notice is that there's three hydrogen bonding sites in uh, in between those two uh, bases and there are two uh, hydrogen bonding sites in between these two bases adenine and thymine and this this num these numbers of hydrogen bonding sites is why C is said to complement G and A is said to complement T 
So this gives us w the way that the molecule zips itself up, so to speak. The next screencast is going to start with the central dogma of molecular biology. <clears throat> and now that we know the structure, what we can start to understand is the process of replication and the process of transcription and the process of translation. And this diagram gives you uh, a schematic understanding of what those processes mean. DNA replication is really when it makes copies of itself or it makes more of itself. And transcription is when DNA is uh, rewritten into little short segments of RNA. And when RNA is translated, we say that RNA is changed into a different language of amino acids, which eventually build together to form proteins. This main idea of molecular biology, it describes the flow of how genetic information translates into proteins. And we will discuss in the next screencasts the process of replication, <clears throat> and then we'll discuss the process of transcription, and then we will discuss the process of translation. So that's it for now, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, please use your screencast note-taking template, and hopefully you wrote down any questions that you have, and you can ask those questions in class. And don't forget to answer that really all-important question, so what? So why is this important, and why is it significant? Thanks, guys. See you next time.